Thanks for taking the time to watch or listen into this sermon. Our prayer is always that God would use it to draw you closer to himself and deepen your love for Jesus Christ. It's also our hope that this sermon would not be used to replace God's plan for authentic relationships in your life through a local church. If you aren't already a member of a local church, we just want to encourage you to step out in faith and join a church somewhere near you. Thanks again for checking out this sermon. We pray it is a blessing to you. God, we thank you for the opportunity to be here. God, you are amazing, and we are grateful. Lord, you are faithful, and your presence is here in those that believe and amongst us as we gather in your name. God, we uh, just thank you for that. Lord, I ask that as we open your word, you would speak to all of our hearts individually, speak to us corporately. God, that you would move in this place in miraculous ways. In Jesus' name, amen. So like I said, next week we'll focus on the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the message. It'll be a standalone message. But today, um, we're going to get back to a series that we've been in called Supporting Cast. This whole series has been a look at the fact that the Bible is the story of God. The main character in Scripture is not you or I or any of the other names that we find in there, but the main character, the hero of all of Scripture is God himself. And so we've looked at, um, in this series, supporting cast, the, the supporting cast members in God's story and how we can learn from how God reveals himself to them and, and deals with mankind. And so we started at the very beginning. I can't do a, a full review of the series so far because I've realized the further we get into this, the review gets longer and longer and longer. And pretty soon it's going to be like a 40-minute review and then I'll introduce a character and we'll go home. So I'd love for you to catch up on the series if you can. I think it would be beneficial. We've pretty much just plowed through Genesis um, and looked at God's amazing plan and some of the people he's worked through and with in that uh, book of the Bible. Um, and today, we're finishing up looking at Joseph. Not only will it be a finishing of the story of Joseph, but it'll be a finishing of the book of Genesis. So if you've been here the last 12, 13 weeks, um, you've gone through the book of Genesis, Maybe that's not a big deal to you, it's a big deal to me, because I preached through the book of Genesis, and you uh, keep coming back, so that's a big deal for me. Um, but let me just at least tell you a little bit about Joseph, even though I can't tell you about everybody else. He's in the line of a guy maybe you've heard of before, Abraham, who had Isaac, who had Jacob, who God said his name is now Israel. Maybe you've heard of Israel before. He has 12 sons, which are the 12 tribes of Israel. The guy we're looking at today, Joseph, the Bible decides to kind of get a little closer look and follow that son for the next 13 chapters in Scripture to finish the book of Genesis. He's the 11th of 12 boys. Huh. So yesterday we go out to my mom's, my mom and dad's, and uh, we do a little pre-Easter, Easter Easter celebration. And uh, we have two sons, Uh, my sister and her husband, they have two sons, and so just four little boys running around. Um, and let me tell you, just four little boys under the age of six is fun. <laughs> fun. Twelve boys? Like, that's insane. Um, and I don't mean that if you have 12 boys, I'm not trying to make you sound insane. But I'm just saying that that's, that's a lot. That's a lot of chaos. That's a lot of food. That's a lot of fights. Like, that's a lot going on. And so he's the 11th of 12, and he's the, he's the first son of Jacob's, uh, one of Jacob's wives, Rachel. It's Jacob's favorite wife. It's his firstborn to her. It's his favorite child. He plays favorites. Don't do that, parents. Don't play favorites. Um, And if you are wrestling through favoritism in your heart, don't let it come out of your heart. Deal with it between you and God and maybe talking to somebody else. Um, Jacob does something you shouldn't do uh, he makes his son stand out as the one that is the favorite. He makes him a coat, uh, an ornate, colorful coat, a coat of many colors. Maybe you've heard of it before. So he's the, the most loved. We pick up the story understanding who Joseph is. He's 17 years old with this special coat because he's daddy's favorite. And then he has these dreams that he tells his brothers about, hey, someday you guys are going to bow down to me. He's got 10 older brothers. That's not good for your health. You're going to bow down to me. And so they start plotting. They hate him. They're mad at him. And so they plot and they plan. And he comes out one day and they take an opportunity here to to plan to murder him, their own brother. 
In fact, on his way out, they say, here comes that dreamer. They're mocking him to say, we're going to get rid of him. He thinks we're going to bow down to him. We're going to kill him. They change their mind. Instead of killing him, they decide, you know what? We wouldn't get anything out of that. Let's sell him into slavery. And so he, they sell him to some merchants that are headed down to Egypt. Go back and tell their dad that he must be dead. And they, they sell their dad on, on the death of his favorite son, even though he's alive. But to them, he's as well off as dead. It's sent down to Egypt. He's in slavery. He gets bought by a man named Potiphar, who's an official, the Pharaoh. Kind of a big deal. But he still get bought, gets bought as a slave. And the Bible says the Lord is with him. As far as we know, he's the only person in the whole kingdom of Egypt um, at this time, the, the empire, that loves God and walks with God by himself. We struggle sometimes. We get a whole bunch of other people that love Jesus. This dude is in a pagan land, far from home, and he's a slave, but God is with him, and he favors him, and he moves up in this home until he's in charge of everything that is his master's. The only thing his master worries about is, what am I going to eat? And the only problem he finds in Potiphar's house is Potiphar's wife is scandalous. And Potiphar's wife um, tries to coerce him and manipulate him and get him in bed with her, but he denies her, and she doesn't like that, so she falsely accuses him, and he gets thrown into prison. So this dude was going to be killed, was sold into slavery by his own brothers, is in slavery. Now he works up to this place of position of some sort of power inside of this home that he's at, and he gets thrown into prison because he's falsely accused. Things aren't going well. But God is with him. Something amazing happens inside of that prison. He does so well as a prisoner that he gets put in charge of all the prisoners and in charge of all the operations inside of that prison. Again, he's second only to the warden. And it happens to be a prison where when Pharaoh gets mad at somebody in his own house, they get sent there. God does this miraculous thing and sovereignly uh, gives him the interpretation of some people's dreams. Some guys that used to work with Pharaoh um, a cupbearer and a baker have these dreams, and God tells them what they are. And so he glorifies God and uh, saying that God is the only one that can interpret dreams, and then he interprets these dreams. And what, what God is doing is establishing uh, this chain of events so that he will be put before Pharaoh. So Pharaoh has a crazy dream later. I don't know if you were here last week, but Pharaoh has this crazy dream, kind of a nightmare, where these Seven healthy-looking cows come out of the Nile, and then seven nasty, gaunt-looking cows eat them. That's not gross to you? Like zombie cows or something, okay? Like, it's nasty. So he has another dream with, with grain that's the same kind of dream, and, and Joseph, in one day, goes from the pit. He's in the dungeon, um, and in your, some of your Bibles will say he's in the pit. In the prison, he gets brought up before Pharaoh. God blesses him, gives him the ability to tell Pharaoh what his dream is and then to be brave enough to say, and Pharaoh, this is what you should do about it. What the, what the dream was is God is telling you that there will be seven years of massive abundance and then after that will be seven years of such horrific famine that you won't even remember the abundance. And what you should do is you should tax all the people during that time, collect all of these goods so that when the famine comes, we have things. Where we left off last week is Pharaoh listens to him, puts him in second in charge in all of Egypt. He was just a prisoner. Before that, a slave. Before that, the most hated of his brothers. And now he's second only to Pharaoh. And really, he's running Egypt. Pharaoh sits on the throne, but he runs Egypt. And then the famine hits the world around him. And the Bible tells us that People from all over have to come to Egypt to buy food because God in his sovereign plan has brought food here for a reason. He gave this plan for a reason. And so if you're with me, uh, we're going to start in Genesis 42, and I'm going to attempt to do something um, great today. I say that because last week we went through two chapters for the whole day. The week before that we went through two chapters. It took us the whole day. Um, with my remaining time, we're going to go through nine chapters so buckle up. I had my coffee, so hopefully you had yours. Chapter 42 is where we're at. Famine has hit the whole world. There's food in Egypt, and it starts like this. When Jacob learned that there was grain in Egypt, he said to his sons, just to warn you, I'm not going to read through nine chapters right now. That would be a lot. 
We're going to go through nine, so some of it's not going to get into great detail. I promise you it's in your Bible. You should read it, the things that I can't get through today. When Jacob learned that there was grain in Egypt, and so Joseph's father now in Canaan is hearing that there's food in Egypt. They're going through the famine also. He said to his sons, Joseph's brothers, why do you just keep looking at each other? He continued, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down there, buy some, <laughs> buy some for us, so that we may live and not die. Let me just give you a little bit of context. At this point, Joseph is between 37 and 39, okay? Because he started working for Pharaoh at 30. The seven years of abundance are up. He's between 37 and 39. Ten of those brothers are older than him, so most all of them are in their 40s. There's, they have their own families now at this point. Their own families are running out of food. And their dad has to look at them. They're in their 40s. His dad has to look at them and go, quit looking at each other. Go get some food. It's easy for us to laugh at, but I, I just kind of feel, as I started to study this this week, um, that oftentimes we can be those people as Christians. He says, there's, there's life out there, and you're just sitting here looking at each other and talking. I told you to go. Like, the, you know to go. That's where life's at, but you just sit here and talk. Okay. The whole Great Commission is about going. And we can easily, as church, just get here and go like, what do you guys think about that going thing? Isn't it great? I heard there's life out there somewhere. Let's just sit here and die. Okay. That's not even part of today's message, so you can tell it's going to be fun today. So he tells him this, go get us food. And then 10 of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain from Egypt, but Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother. He's the only one that's, that's Joseph's full blood brother. They have the same mother who who passed away giving birth to Benjamin. And so it's only full blood Joseph. With the others, because he was afraid that harm might come to him. So Jacob prefers Joseph and Benjamin. He's afraid, I already lost Joseph. I don't want to lose Benjamin. So he doesn't get to go, only the 10 older brothers. So Israel's sons were among those who went to buy grain. The whole world's going. For there was a famine in the land of Canaan also. Now Joseph was the governor of the land, the person who sold grain to all its people. So when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. <laughs> the reason they hate this guy when he's 17 is because he looks at him and says, I have this dream, and in my dream you bow down to me. And they say, we got to kill this dude. And now this dream clearly was from God. It's, it's coming to fruition. And they don't even know it's him. They just come in to try to get food from the person in charge that has food. And so they all come and they, they bow down. As soon as Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them. But he pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them. That, that's interesting, right? He recognized them, but they didn't recognize him. And when he sees them, he speaks harshly to them. He's kind of keeping the distance. And, and when it says he speaks to them, we'll find out that, that he speaks through an interpreter. One of the reasons they don't recognize him, one, is because their faces to the ground, because they're coming in humility to try to get grain. But the main purpose is for the last over 20 years, he's been in Egypt. And so a lot changes from 17 to 37. Who's been to their 20-year reunion? <laughs> Nobody looks like the yearbook. <laughs> so there's a lot that happens in those times. So not only has he just grown up and become this man, but also he's been in Egypt. He's wearing Egyptian robes and Egyptian gold. He's got an Egyptian wife and an Egyptian name, and he's speaking in a different language than them. And so when they come in, they don't recognize him. They don't know whatever happened to him. They don't recognize him, but he recognizes them because how many know that you know when 10 of your brothers roll up? <laughs> so... He speaks harsh to them and says, where do you come from, he asked. From the land of Canaan, they replied to buy food. Here we go. Then Joseph recognized his brothers. They did not recognize him. Then he remembered his dreams about them and said to them, you are spies. You have come to see where our land is unprotected. No, my Lord, they answered. Your servants have come to buy food. We are all the sons of one man. Your servants are honest men, not spies. No, he said to them, you have come to see where our land is unprotected. He's up to something. But they replied, your servants are 12 brother, were 12 brothers, the sons of one man who lives in the land of Canaan. The youngest is now with our father, and one is no more. That's nuts. I can't imagine just being a fly on the wall there. 
seeing what's going on, and, and Joseph is hearing them say, one of them isn't here anymore. And he's the one. He's that guy. And so what he does is he continues with this line of calling them spies. And he says, I'm going to give you a test because I think you're a spy. This is what's going to happen. I'm going to put all of you in jail. And one of you has to go back and get the youngest brother and bring him here. Because that's how you're going to prove to me that you're not spies. So he throws them all in jail for three days. And on the third day, he gets them out of jail and says, okay, I changed my mind. Instead of all of you staying and one of you going, one of you staying and the rest of you are going. So nine of you are going to go back and get your brother. Um, and, and Simeon, well, he doesn't call him by name, I don't think, but he takes Simeon and has him bound up right in front of them and thrown into prison, sends the rest of them on their way. In doing so, he also tells his servant, okay, put grain in their bags. They came here to buy food. Put grain in their bags. Put their silver that they used to buy the food back into their bags. He's up to something. And then send them on their way. So they leave with their provision. And, and when they stop that night, one of the brothers opens his sack to feed his animal and finds his silver in the sack. This guy spoke to him harshly. He was pretty rough with him. And now it looks like I stole his money. And so he tells the brothers and the brothers, it says their, their hearts sank. And they say, like, why is God doing this to us? So they get home to Jacob, minus one of their brothers, by the way. They get home to Jacob. Actually, I kind of skipped part of it. I want to let you know. When, when, when Joseph has told them that they have to go get their brother and that they're going to go to jail, they have a conversation with each other in their own language that they don't know that he can understand. Listen to what they say. They said to one another, surely we are being punished because of our brother. How much guilt have you carried for 20 years? That when someone you don't think you know is punishing you, you look at each other and go, finally back to get us. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life, but we would not listen. That's why this distress has come on us. And then Reuben, one that tried to save him back in the day when they were going to kill him, says, I told you not to touch that boy. <laughs> and Joseph, has to, he, he understands what they're saying. He has to turn away and weep and kind of gather himself when they can't see him and come back to them. And that's when he sends them back with the stuff. So they get back home with their dad, Jacob. Tell him what happened. Simeon's in jail now. The guy was mean to us, thought we were spies, and told us we have to bring Benjamin back to prove that we're not spies. Then they open their bags, and each one of them finds their silver back in their bags. Their dad is not happy about this. In fact, he's very distraught. They come back with their silver they were supposed to use to pay for this. They come back with the grain, and he says, I've already lost Joseph. Now they've taken Simeon, and you want to take Benjamin. Why is everything against me? Everything's against me. Then one of his sons, Reuben, says, you know what? Send Benjamin back with me, and if I don't come back with him, you can kill my boys. First of all, what? <laughs> and could you imagine being one of his sons? You're one of Reuben's sons, and Reuben makes a promise, and it's your life in the balance. Okay, Dad? How about your own head? Right? So there's a situation, and, and he says, let me, let me take Benjamin back, and my boys will be on the line. And, and Jacob says, no, you guys aren't going back. Simeon's going to have to stay in jail. We lost Joseph. Now we've lost Simeon, and we're not going to lose Benjamin. So we're just going to sit here, and we're going to make it. Well, the famine keeps going, and guess what happens when the famine keeps going? You eat your food, and you're out of food again. And there's only food in one place. God has this huge plan from the beginning of all of this to, to align all of this. And so uh, Jacob looks at his sons and says, go get more food. Like, what are we, we can't just sit here and die. Go get more food. And Judah, one of his sons, says, hey, Dad, I don't know if you remember. That guy said, we can't see his face again unless we bring the youngest brother with us. And Jacob's response to him is, why'd you even tell him you had a younger brother? Like, why'd you even tell him that? And they say, he thoroughly questioned us and thought we were spies. They were being mean, right? Like, he was being mean to them. And he told us we were spies. Like, we had to answer these questions, right? And how are we to know he's going to ask for our little brother? And what happens is Judah says this, this awesome line. Judah takes responsibility on himself, not on his kids. And he says this. Then Judah said to Israel, his father, 
Send the boy along with me, and we will go at once, so that we and you and our children may live and not die. I myself will guarantee his safety. You can hold me personally responsible for him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him here before you, I will bear the blame before you all my life. That's awesome. Can I just tell you, um, the shift between immaturity and maturity is responsibility. It's taking responsibility. It's when, it's when boys become men and girls become women. It's that shift of, oh, it's everybody else's fault. I depend on everybody else for everything and, and doing like Judah does here. And he says, like, listen, I'll take care of it. It's on me. If something doesn't happen, I get it. It's on me. That's rare. Like what happens is a lot of people will say that, and then when push comes to shove, it's like, well, you don't understand the circumstance. All these things happened. <laughs> Judah just straight up is like, it's me, and I, and I will bear the burden of whatever that will look like if I don't bring him back, but I'm going to bring him back. And so Jacob, their dad, Israel, says, well, you have to go, right? So this is what I want you to do. Take the best of our land that we have here and bring it with you. Take twice as much silver as last time because you owe them and you need to get more food. And then take your brother Benjamin and he ends it by saying this, may God Almighty grant you mercy. Man, he says like, listen, not only are we gonna send the best of what we have hoping to get some sort of favor here, but also I'm really hoping God comes through on this because I've lost a lot already. I can't imagine losing Benjamin. You guys still following with me okay? That's a lot, it's a long story. So the men hurry up to Egypt. They present themselves before Joseph. You, Joseph, you have to remember, they don't know this is their brother. As far as they know, he's as good as dead, but he knows. They present themselves before him. He sees them. He sees his uh, younger brother there with them, and, and he says, uh, go to my house, and he tells his servant, slaughter an animal. I'm going to be there at noon to have a meal with these guys. Nobody knows it's his brothers but him. I'm going to be there at noon to have a meal. They start going to the house, and on the way to the house, they start talking to each other, and they're getting a little bit nervous, and they think the reason they're going to the house is to be held accountable for taking their silver back. They think that they're about to be uh, punished. And so they're on the way, and they start talking to the steward of uh, Joseph's house. They, they start saying, like, hey, here's the deal. We were on the way back. I remember we paid you, but we were on the way back, and silver was in our bags. We want to make it up to you. We brought silver. And the steward has this line. He says, um, God's the one that put that back in there. I received the silver you gave. So he says, you're off the hook. You're stressed out about this, but you're off the hook. I received your silver. Now, even though he's the one that put it back in there, he's saying, by the grace of God, that was put back in there. You didn't deserve it. It was just put in there. But, but I received what, like, you're, we're clean. And so he gives them water. They wash up. They get their gifts ready. Joseph shows up at noon for the meal. They present their gifts. They bow down before him. It's this... Amazing scene. They bring Simeon out because, you know, he's been locked up. Joseph asks them about their aged father that they had talked about before. It's his father. And he sees Benjamin, his little brother, and he runs off and weeps. He's crying again. Joseph weeps several times during this story because his heart is moved. This is not some weakling of a man. The Bible says he was well-built and handsome, and he's got all the power in Egypt but his heart is moved. And right now he's going to weep enough that he has to run off to weep. And he comes back when he composes himself. And Joseph and his brothers and the, the Egyptians that are there, they all have to be served separately um, in this meal together because it's not right for Egyptians to eat with Hebrews. And so they're all eating in the same area, but they have to sit at a different table and use different utensils. And the brothers are astonished. They're blown away because... They're all sitting there, and they've been put in order of age. Now, most of these brothers are within seven-year span of each other. And so they're really close in age. And in your 40s, it's really hard to tell a couple of years, give or take. And so they're, they're put in order and looking at each other like, this is crazy. Nobody could know this except, obviously, Joseph, right? So they're sitting there. They all get their food. And then Benjamin um, gets five times as much food as everybody else. He's extra blessed, which I just think is crazy because... If everybody else has enough to eat for a meal, how much food was in front of this dude? <laughs> Probably looked like most of us do on Thanksgiving. 
So they feasted and they drank freely together. And so they still don't know that it's Joseph. They're there in his presence, and now they're at least not afraid of maybe the punishment that's going to come, but, but they still don't know, and they're about to go back with their brothers and their stuff, and Joseph looks to his servant, his steward of his house, and he says, this is what I want you to do. Give them all the food they need, give them the grain, put their silver back in their bag, and take my silver cup, and put it in Benjamin's bag, the young one, put that in his bag, and put, leave, have them leave. So they leave, they're on their way, they just get out of the city, they're not very far at all, and he sends his steward of his house, his servant, to go after them. They barely made it out of town, he goes after them, he catches up and he says, hey, I'm here, how could you guys do this? You stole from my master. And they're like, no, there's no way that we would do that. There's no way we would do that. In fact, if somebody has that cup, they they should die, and the rest of us will become slaves. (laughs) So they start with the oldest, they open the bags, and they're silver, 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 they get to the youngest, and they open it, and there's the cup. So they tear their clothes. They're like, this can't be happening. They go back into the city. They go to Joseph's house. Joseph is still there. This is a quick interaction. They get back to Joseph's house. Joseph is still there at that space. And they say, we're all your slaves. You found this? We're all your slaves now. And Joseph says, that wouldn't be right of me. Just the one who had the cup will be my slave. It's his brother, his full blood brother. The rest of you can go. And then Judah, the one that that promised that the boy would come back with him, explains the situation. Here's the deal. I promised my dad I'm bringing this kid back. He's a really important son to him. And we've already lost one of um, his sons. And if I go back there and tell my dad that Benjamin's here and all of us came back, that report will literally kill him. His heart cannot handle that report. And so what I'd, I'd like to do is, um, I'd like to be your slave. Send my brother home because I could not bear to see my father hear that report and die before my eyes. Judah's. And so he, he makes these statements and asks if he can be the slave instead of Benjamin. And then if you're taking notes, right, it's me. It's me. Check this out in the beginning of chapter 45. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all of his attendants. And he cried out, have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept, he's crying again, so loudly that the Egyptians heard him and Pharaoh's household heard about it. So none of his attendants are in there. There's no, one, there's no Egyptians in that space with him. It's just him and his brothers. And he weeps so loud that the Egyptians can hear him. And word on the street gets back to Pharaoh that like, your boy is crying. And he's crying hard. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph! Exclamation point. Is my father still living? He has questions about his dad. But listen to this. His brothers were not able to answer him. Because they were terrified at his presence. He asked them a simple question. How's, I'm Joseph, how's dad? And they're like, freaked out. Terrified, the Bible says. They don't know how to respond at all. The last time they saw him, they had, he, he had been pleading for his life. They were going to kill him. And instead they sold him into slavery like, and they left him for dead. And, and who knows what happens to him? And now, Before them is one of the most powerful people in all of a massive empire. And he says, I'm that dude. Okay. I'm I'm about to show you that Joseph is a man not like men I meet. He's much greater than myself. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. Now, how many know that for most of us right here, this is where I turn a different direction than Joseph probably? How many know most of us go like, I'm the one you sold into Egypt, exclamation point. Ha! Look at me now. 
When he was powerless in their presence, they took advantage of that and sold him off into slavery. Now he, they are powerless in his presence, and his response is not like you or us. Right here is where it would be like, man, I had 22 years thinking about this. Go time. Now listen to this guy. It's amazing. This guy has a perspective outside of circumstance or situation. He has a perspective that that God is greater. God has an ultimate plan that is greater than our own and will even use our struggles and, and, and our hard times to get us to the place that he wants us to be in for the works that he is doing. He has a perspective way up here and, and most of us have a hard time. I'm not trying to, listen, I have a hard time living up here. It's easy to get wrapped up in circumstance and situation. Listen to this. I'm your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now, do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. What? You sold me into slavery. But don't stress about it. Quit beating yourself up about it. They're, they're terrified because they know what they've done. They were, they're wicked. And he says, quit stressing about that. You sold me into slavery, but God sent me ahead. Listen to this. For two years now, there has been famine in the land, and for the next five years, there will be no plowing or reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. This guy, he's looking at these guys that that were going to kill them, kill him, but that didn't make them any money, so they sold him instead. To them, he's as good off as dead. That's the last time they had an experience together, and he looks at them and says, you sold me into slavery, but God put me here. You wanted to kill me. God put me here to save you, and he used your wickedness way back then to get me to where I needed to be now, and I went through slavery, and I went through prison, and he says, but don't beat yourself up about it. I'm here so you can live. (laughs) Man, we get a hard time forgiving somebody that cut us off in traffic. <laughs> Sorry, I'm picturing my own reaction uh, when someone cuts me off in traffic. <laughs> yep. So this, this guy just... He has this perspective. Instead of 22 years of, of just wrestling through that and going like, I'm going to get him, I'm going to get I'll see them again and I'm going to get him. He has 22 years of just some, some really hard times in there um, where he's going, God has a plan in this? God has an ultimate plan in this? That he would be able to identify when his brothers come before him and bow down and, and there's famine throughout the whole world? Like, this is what God was doing. You guys are wicked, and God even used your wickedness for his good, for his glory. That, that, that people's lives would be saved and people would be delivered. Man, to be able to keep your heart from getting bitter in that space is a miracle. And when it talks about the fact that the Lord was with him and he walked with God through this, you can see it in that statement. So he goes on to say, God made me a ruler here in Egypt. And then he gives them the plan moving forward. You know what? Go get dad. Go get everything. You come to Egypt. He embraces them. He talks with his brothers. Pharaoh hears that his brothers are there and and tells them this plan of provision. Give them everything they need to go get your family and come back here. Give them an abundance of food. And even says, give them these carts, these big carts. So instead of having to bring everything on donkeys or by hand, um, they get these big carts to go with them. They get pulled by animals so that you can fill them with uh, people. Like you could put uh, the old father and then you could put the women and the children and so it makes a much easier ride and so he says like hey if you're going to get your family you've been great to me in all of this you've saved Egypt and you're my right hand guy like if it's your family it's family so let's take care of them so he sends them off with all of this provision um, on their way new clothes food these carts um, and then Joseph is in charge of making sure that gets distributed so he blesses his brother Benjamin again he gets more than everybody else um so they, they, they do that, they get back home, and then this is just, I can't imagine the situation here being in this. They, they get home to their dad, to Israel, known as, or Jacob, known as Israel, and they come to him and they say, Joseph is still alive. Can you imagine? 
A couple of weeks back, we talked about when Jacob realized that Joseph is probably dead, that he is dead, and, and he is broken. He says, I will not be comforted in my mourning. I will mourn every day of my life until my head is, like, until I go down into the grave with him. He's been broken in this space for 22 years. He's been missing his son. You can tell when he talks about his other sons and potentially losing them that it still affects him massively. And, and so he's just believed that his favorite son is dead for 22 years and then to have his sons come back and to not even know if your sons are coming back. Last time they left, they took another kid you didn't want to go. A guy already has another one in prison and, and they were treated harshly last time. Who knows how it's going to go? But to see 11 of them return and then to have the thing that they say to you is, Joseph is still alive. In fact, he is ruler of all Egypt. I cannot imagine the emotions he was going through. Jacob was stunned. He did not believe them. That makes sense. That seems unbelievable. But when they told him everything Joseph had said to them, and when he saw the carts Joseph had sent to carry him back, the spirit of their father Jacob revived. Huh. Good news can do that. He's been... He's been stressing about are they coming back I might lose Benjamin I've already lost Simeon I've already lost Joseph will anybody come back and now not only do I see my boys coming but I hear the one that I've lost is alive the spirit of their father Jacob is revived and Israel said I'm convinced my son Joseph is still alive I will go and see him before I die I want to tell you something real quick I'm going to move very quickly through this because we need to get to the end it's in your Bible I promise read it what happens next is they, uh, they pack up and they go. And on the way to Egypt, they stop at one place so they can offer sacrifices. God shows up in a vision um, to the father, Jacob, to tell him, do not be afraid. You're going to go, then you're going to see your son. And so they get there and, and Pharaoh works it out so that they have like the, the best place in Egypt to be shepherds with their livestock. And even during this famine, they're in the best place in Egypt. And then Joseph's plan of action that he told Pharaoh to do, he's the one executing it. And so there's seven years of good, seven years of famine. During that years of famine, um, it, he, the plan that God gave him saves the lives of all the Egyptians and prospers Pharaoh massively. So there's this thing that plays out where everybody uses all their money for food because it's a famine. And so there, there's nothing they can do to work. And so they, all the money they do have, they use. And, and now everybody's broke. In the whole land of Egypt, nobody has money. And now they're hungry again, so they're stressed out. And they're like, we're all going to die. All we have is livestock. And he says, that's a great idea. Let's do an exchange for livestock. And so they bring their livestock for food. So now they have no money. They have no livestock. And the next year, they're all hungry again. And they come to Joseph. And they're like, hey, we don't have food or we don't have uh, livestock or money, but we're starving. All we have now is our lives and our land. And Joseph's like, that's a great idea. So what he does is, for Pharaoh, he buys up all the land of Egypt with food. And he also makes everyone in Egypt, uh, puts them into a place of servitude. And so from here on out in, in the nation of Israel, there's this 20% um, tax on all crops because Pharaoh owns everything. And so it prospers Pharaoh greatly. And you would think the people would be like, we're so oppressed, this is horrible. But actually they sing praises uh, of Joseph because they're so excited they're still alive. When the rest of the world is dying of famine, thank goodness that you prepared for us. And so they're like, you saved our lives while they've given up their money, their livestock, their land, and their own lives. And so they get to this place, and during that same time, the Bible says that, that the nation of Israel settled in that region, that they were fruitful and multiplied, that it went well for them, even during this famine. What happens is Jacob gets kind of older in life. It's time for him to die, and, and so he has to bless his kids. He blesses his grandkids. He blesses his own kids. I wish I could get into that, but I can't. Before he dies, he makes J Joseph promise him, I'm not from this land, Egypt. I need to be buried back in Canaan. So Joseph does make that promise. Jacob dies. Joseph goes to Pharaoh and says, hey, I told my dad I wouldn't bury him here because we're not from here, that, that I'd bury him back home. And you would think that Pharaoh would be like, okay, cool, do whatever you want, just like under the radar. Pharaoh Joseph has massive favor in Pharaoh's eyes. Instead of making it like this quiet, go ahead and go bury your dad, Pharaoh puts together basically this huge parade of people with all the officials of Egypt that mourn for the loss of Jacob and, and take him out to be buried in his own land. They come back and there's something that happens after Jacob passes away. The other brothers are stressed out. They think that 
you know, Joseph has been nice to them, but they're concerned that the only reason Joseph was nice is because their dad's still alive. That, hey, he likes dad, and he knows dad likes us, and so the only reason he hasn't gotten rid of us or punished us is because dad's still here. Now that dad's gone, how's this going to go? So look at this. Then we'll end it. I know. Oh, actually, I'm doing good on time. Nine chapters? Pfft, shoot. Chapter 50, verse 15. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him? So they sent word to Joseph saying, they make up this story to try to protect themselves. Your father left these instructions before he died. This is what you were to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now please forgive the sins of the servants of the God of your father. Like that. They're like, we're a little bit nervous and we're not sure our word carries any weight. So what if we go to him and tell him that dad told him, told us to tell him to forgive us. And not only that, but let's remind him that we're servants of God. Like they're really scared here. They're trying to have a power play. Like what if we use dad's word and we talk about God, maybe it'll go well for us. So they come there and they're, they're trying to win favor. And it says, when the message came to him, Joseph wept. He's crying again. He's brokenhearted. Like they don't understand what he's trying to tell them. They feel like they have to manipulate still. They're still working in their wickedness to try to make sure they're good. Joseph is trying to tell them, like, I don't hold this against you. God had a plan greater than your wickedness. Okay. His brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? It's a great question right there. What he's saying right there is you, there is an accountability for sin, but I'm not the one that holds people accountable for it. So they sinned against him, and he says, you need to take that up with God. I'm not the capital J judge here. Okay. Now listen to this. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. <laughs> These guys were going to kill him, looked in his eyes as he was stressed out, pleading for his life. And he saw back from them no mercy at all. He saw back from them wickedness to, to take out their own brother. Sold into slavery by his own blood. He's in slavery for some time and then gets falsely accused and thrown into prison. How many know that that could be a reminder of, I can't believe I'm even in this place. My brother should have never done this and, and remind you of their wickedness. But somehow in this, as he walks through it with God, he says, like, even in this struggle, God's got an ultimate plan that's greater than this. Then in prison, he, he, he moves up to a position where God has put him in a place for his sovereign plan to be played out. And he, he gets to stand before Pharaoh one day, and he gets put in the position of second in charge of all of Egypt. And in that space, he could abuse his power, but instead, walking with the Lord, realizes he's been positioned where he's at He's been saved. He's been uh, brought to this place and restored to a position of strength for this purpose so that others would be saved. That even in him going through the hard things, that God had an intention to use those to get him to this place. I don't know if you're hearing me right now. I don't know what you've been through. I don't know what you're going through right now. But I pray that we would have the perspective that Joseph has. That God, you have an ultimate plan that is greater than what I can see with my eyes right now while I'm in slavery or while I'm in prison or even when I was in the pit in the beginning. That even in other people's wickedness and, and how things are, are being a, put against me and, and, and things seem to be trying to be bad towards me, that you have an ultimate plan that is greater than my own and you're going to use this for the saving of others. This guy challenges hearing the story of this and, and seeing how he longs to walk with God and that he sees God's intentions as greater than men's challenges me. 
Like, like I said, I have a hard time working through forgiveness sometimes. This dude had a reason. <laughs> you see him walk in this mercy, in this grace. The brothers that showed him none are now before him, and he has all the power in the world, and he extends mercy that was not extended to him by them, and he sees a bigger picture of God's ultimate plan. And I just want to tell you today, like, I persevere and endure. Continue on this plan. You don't know when the day comes when you're in a position that those things you went through provide a way for you to be a piece of the saving of someone's life. That, that your expression of the goodness of God, even through struggle, the grace of God, the mercy of God, and you being able to articulate that, that he was with you even in hard times, might be what helps reveal who God is to somebody else. And in that moment, they would be saved. And so we have to remember that. We have to see that in these stories. We have to. Not that Joseph is not the main character. God is. We see his sovereign hand. We see his faithful work. We see his purposed plan in all of it. We have to remember that God is our God and he loves us massively to keep on through this and keep on through this. And one of the beauties that we have that he didn't have, he's alone in this nation by himself trying to honor God. We have each other. We're not alone. We have the Holy Spirit that dwells inside of us. We have fellow believers to walk along with us. Huh. We're going to do uh, a couple things here. In a moment, we're going to pray. In fact, if you, could, if you could just stand up with me as the worship team comes up. Hmm. In all of the story of Joseph, we, we see that his brothers don't show mercy or grace, but that Joseph can identify that God does extend mercy and grace to him throughout this process. And his response to them isn't out of the lack of mercy of his brothers, but out of the beautiful grace and mercy he received from God even in struggle. Pray that by God's Holy Spirit, he's speaking to our hearts in here today and speaking to our lives and, and, and helping us to see that although he did not push those people to do wicked things against you, they did that in their own choice, in their own wickedness, he does have a plan of redeeming it. He's a good God that loves you massively and has not left you alone to go through what you're going through in this broken world. And he's with you to walk with you. He sent other people along to walk with you. More than any of this is he sent us Christ Jesus that we could have that access, that we can have that relationship with God through Christ, and, and that we could, even in the broken world around us with the circumstances and situations, we can sing of his praises for the goodness he has shown us in, in this space. I'm going to pray for us. Right after I pray for us, we're going to get back into praising God through song. As we do so, there'll be prayer partners at each side. If you need prayer for anything, they would love the opportunity to pray with you. We believe in the power of prayer. Don't run off after I pray and we get into that time. You're not dismissed yet. We're just here for a few more minutes. After we, we worship God through song, Billy's going to come back up here, and he's going to talk to you about some ways specifically that you can respond to what God's doing in your heart today. Let's pray. God, I thank you for the opportunity to be here. God, I thank you for your word, that we get to see that, that you are faithful, that you are gracious and merciful that you are sovereign and powerful. God, you are so good. You are so loving. Lord, I pray that in this space right now, you are moving like only you can move. God, as your presence is amongst us, that, that God, you would just be revealing yourself to us 
on a deeper level. God, that you would draw us closer to you. God, that you would extend your miraculous hand to do phenomenal things, Lord God. God, I pray that right now um, you would be healing physical brokenness. God, I pray that right now you would be reconciling relational brokenness. God, I pray right now that where there, is, where there is lack, you would come through and provide in phenomenal ways. God, I pray that where there is, there is hurt, God, that you would just do a mending and a healing work there. God, where there is confusion, God, bring clarity and focus. God, where there is chaos, bring peace that surpasses all understanding. That there is a peace that is found in you. Let us be found in you where that peace is. God, I pray that we would be sensitive to your presence, your word, your voice. Give us ears to hear. Give us the courage, boldness, and faith to respond. God, help us to trust you more than we already do. Wherever we're at on that trust spectrum, Lord, God, help us to, to trust you more in every area of our life. And God, I thank you that in this time, you've been doing a work inside of us. Whether it's a work we can clearly articulate or one that we just know is happening, although we don't know how to say it. Thank you, Lord. God, I thank you for what you're doing right now. I thank you for what you're going to do this week as we go into an amazing time of, of a hyper-focus on, on Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection. God, I pray for every invite that will be extended. God, that you give all of us the words to say as we invite others. God, that you have already prepared the hearts of those people, God, for a favorable response. God, we pray that you would work through us to bring people into relationship with you. Thank you for all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together.